We are really excited to have our next presenter here. Joel Wanasek is not just a fantastic mixer who's worked with artists like Miave, Vinyl Theater, Bless the Fall, Machine Head. He also is an audio business entrepreneur in his own right. He runs a company you may have heard of called Unstoppable Recording Machine. It's a fantastic podcast. You've got to check it out. Unstoppable Recording Machine podcast. They also do a instructional series called Nail the Mix. And one of my favorite things that Joel has done is a course about speed mixing, about mixing faster. And I think this is a big problem in the modern age. Our tools allow us theoretically, right, to work faster than ever before, more productively than ever before. But so many of us are spending weeks, months, a year on a project. And a lot of that comes from not knowing how to make decisions quickly. So what Joel's going to tell you about today is not about taking shortcuts in your mix. It's about how to make great decisions and mix even better without second guessing yourself all the time. Now, real quick, before we invite him up to the stage, I want to give a big shout out, big thanks to Cubase, Steinberg Cubase, who were able to make this one free to the public. So a round of applause for them, please. It's a really great fit because Joel is a rabid fan of Cubase, and he really thinks that factors in to his approach that allows him to kind of mix faster, more efficiently, more effectively. And I'll tell you why, but really the focus here is on big concepts that you can apply no matter what system you're working on or how you're working. So big round of applause for Mr. Joel Wanasek, please. Who here wants to, is doing audio full-time for a living? Please raise your hand. Who wants to do it full-time for a living? Anybody doing it just for fun? All right, I'm just even having to have more fun today. So anybody want to make more money doing this, even as like a side hustle? Only half of you? Really? No one wants more money? I mean, you can give it to me. I'll take it. No one? All right, cool. All right, sounds good. So. I hope you guys are ready to take notes today. Who's, who's ready to take some kind of notes? Paper, cell phone, whatever, this will be available online. I have a limited time, I have to go fast. I'm a fast talker, so I'm sorry in advance. I'll try to be clear and concise. Well, today I'm gonna teach you guys all how to give yourself a raise by mixing faster, but not just mixing faster, but working faster in general. And you can apply this stuff to pretty much anything in your life, which is pretty cool. So, we need to retain this information, so I need everybody to stand up right now. Let's go. It's early. We're on musician time. Everybody's like, oh, come on, really? Come on. Up. All right, hands in the air. Shake them. Woo! All right, you're going to jump with me. Here we go. Ready, set, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Shake them. And high five the person sitting next to you. Or high five yourself. All right, you may sit down now. You know why I did that? Because according to neuroscientists, when you are in a heightened state of physical activity, you retain information better, which you're going to want to do today. So let's kick this off. Why on earth would you want to get fast at mixing? That's the question. Well, imagine how much better your life could be if you could make more money. You could work less hours or you know, maybe have more control over your time. That's important stuff. Or maybe you could do things like spend more time with your family and your friends. Anybody got kids in here in a family? All right, a few of you. That's good. Um, you can take more vacations. Anybody like vacation? Oh, only a third of you like vacation. <laughs> you got to come to Russia sometime. Well, well, you'll all love vacation then. It's really fun. Okay, what about uh, financial security? Anybody want more financial security doing this stuff? I mean, come on. You can take mixing and make a great side hustle. Anybody in here got a day job that they hate, that they want to quit, that they want to just phew, turn into a career? All right. You guys better pay real good attention to this then. Maybe you can take on more projects. Anybody in here a workaholic freak like me who just can't say no to projects? All right, I love it. That's what I call no small time. So I'm going to teach you how to get better at all that stuff today. The basic premise of this is simple. Time is freedom. And if there is one resource in our lives that we can never get back, other than our health. It is time, because time always moves in one direction. If anybody in, has invented a time machine, please let me know, because I'm gonna go back to when I'm 20 and redo things, because I could be, I, oh. I didn't wish I would have known this stuff a decade ago, that's all I'm saying, I, what I'm about to teach you today. 
So when I say mixing faster, something happens. A lot of people get these weird negative assumptions because they don't know what it means. So like mixing faster, does that mean you're like doing a crappy job or like you don't care about your mixes? And I'm like, no. So let me explain what mixing faster actually means. It is creating systems of optimization which will allow you to prepare mixes as quickly and accurately as possible. It is creating systems for client communication so you can keep your clients happy and coming back while removing all the stressful aspects of this. Anybody in here ever deal with a stressful client and mix notes? You should all have your hands up because if you're not, you're lying or you don't have any clients. It's one or the other. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to help you alleviate that problem today and make it way more streamlined so when your clients come to you, the experience from the first contact through follow through is smoother and they're going to walk out with one of these if you've done your job and you're going to walk out with one of these. Oh, that was way better than anything I've done before. That's exciting. Mixing faster is knowing when a mix is finished so that you can stop guessing and show the client and get their feedback. Has anybody in here actually ever finished a mix? Correct? Oh, you guys are liars. Given there's only four of you. No one has ever finished a mix. There's a difference. We are, a mix is never finished. You guys ever seen that meme where like the skeleton's on the console and it's, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly what I'm talking about. The mix is never finished, but there's a point of diminishing marginal returns where we stop making the mix better and we take the mix and the mix gets worse because we start chasing our tail. So we're going to talk about that. Okay. Now we need to talk about what mixing faster is not because there are misconceptions. When I say mix faster, sometimes people are like, dude, aren't you like sacrificing quality for, I'm like, why would I do that? Why would I want to put out something that sucks and send it to my client? just so I can save time. That's not serving the client, that's not my job. My job is to make the best possible product for my client and take their songs that they've created with this and give this of my own to it in the mix and make it amazing. Mixing faster is not sacrificing quality for speed, it is not taking shortcuts, it is not doing low quality work and it is not calling something a mix, which is in us performing at the best of our abilities. So is everyone clear on what mixing faster is versus isn't? All right, good. Here's the goal of speed mixing. To mix faster, you could, you could put engineer faster, master faster, whatever, whatever you do, post mix faster, whatever. To mix faster by creating systems so you can be more efficient and effective mixing without sacrificing any quality, okay? That's what this is about. Now, there's a huge difference between being efficient and effective and you all need to understand this, because the first time I heard this, I always, I always mix up the words. You could be the most efficient email person in the whole world at organizing emails, but that doesn't help you mix any faster, does it? Does it help you EQ faster? Does it help you know what compressor needs to go on base? Does it know how you, you know, help you gain structure, does it? So being effective is you know, working on things that actually have tangible results in our business. And being efficient is, you know, we know what being efficient means, being very efficient at them. So that's the goal of speed mixing. We want to get efficient, we want to get effective at what we're doing, and we don't want to sacrifice any quality. So, first objection. People are going to be like, well, Joel, and this is why I love the internet, you know, especially comments and like videos, you know, you see like an ad or something, and then somebody totally doesn't understand. They're like, well, dude, this is dumb. As somebody tried to call me out, well, what if somebody isn't good at mixing? Why would you teach them to mix faster? What's wrong with you? And I'm like, isn't teaching them to mix faster dumb since they can't even mix? And I'm like, okay, you think you got a gotcha on me, don't you? I've already thought of that. So real simple. Creating systems of client organization, good workflow habits, what does that have to do with mixing and speed and, and someone's skills? It has nothing to do with it. We are going to create systems today, my friends, that allow us to take control of our business and not let our business control us so that we can scale it, so that we can make it more effective, we can make communications better. You know, that has nothing to do with mixing skills. So look, if your skills are down here and you're just starting and you're not at the top of the A game, you know, mixing the biggest bands in the world, it's okay. You know, your skills are going to get there, but if you have these principles and these things cemented in your business or your side hustle or your hobby or whatever you do, these workflow habits, what's going to happen is you're going to be much better at mixing and much more organized and you're going to set yourself up for success. So that, my friends, is not an objection. That is somebody not understanding. All right, so I want to tell you a little story and then we're going to dive into the really awesome stuff. I'll tell you a story about how this changed my life 
And I'm going to give you some very good stuff today that if you apply even half of it, could have a dramatic impact on your life. Because I can sit here and talk about it all day, but I've already done it. I've, we've given a course over at Unstoppable Recording Machine, my audio school, and I've trained hundreds of people on this and watched it transform their lives radically. And it's really, really powerful to see this. So I know this stuff works. All you need to do is do what Joel says and just simply follow the instructions and listen. Can you do that? What are we going to do? We're going to do what Joel says. What are we going to do? Oh, come on. You guys need to wake up. Get woke. It's like noon and I'm already amped and jacked. I went out last night too. So let me tell you a story about how this changed my life. I started out many, many years ago. I'm 37. When I was uh, 22 and a half, I got my first office job. You know, I went to school, did everything I was supposed to. I loved music, but you know, I just took the stupid college job to make my parents feel good and I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. So I got into that job and after sitting in a cubicle for six months, I'm like, this is hell on earth for someone like me. I can't deal with this. I can't do it. This is not what I do. I don't know what I want to do, but I, I, I'm drawn to music. It's right here. That's what I want to pursue. That's what I want to do with my life. That is my passion. That's what I care about. That's what I think about when I'm sitting there pulling credit reports at the bank. I'm like, ooh, he said you could put a limiter on bass. Oh, that's really awesome. I should try that when I get home. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll have that over in like 10 minutes. But you know, what, what if I tried an 1176 versus an L1? I wonder what that would, you know what I mean? That was like me sitting in an office. I was a terrible employee. Um, so I eventually gave up and just quit my job and started my business. Now, I come from Wisconsin. Has anybody ever here been from Wisconsin, you know, been to Wisconsin? We got one person, two or three. Yeah, Wisconsin is in the, you guys call it flyover country here in New York. Like, it's not even on the map. It doesn't matter, you know, like you fly over us and you like jump your trash on us or something and like, you know, like, oh, that part of the country. There is nothing in Wisconsin other than cornfields. And my, you know, so I started my studio in the middle of cornfields in the middle of nowhere, like an hour drive from like Milwaukee. Okay, so when people want to talk to me about like, oh, you know, it's so hard, I'm in a dead market. Or I'm like, I'm from Milwaukee, dude. Like, don't tell me you're from a dead market. I made it out of Milwaukee. No one ever makes it out of Milwaukee. That was like the thing people told me when I was in my early 20s. Like, oh, you can't be in a band. You got to go to Nashville. You got to go to New York. You got to go to LA. So, you know, I started my business and I was just like, I don't care. You know, there's no big studios. I just started figuring it out and I went at it 100% self-taught. And I went at it with tons of passion. And then something happened. I started to succeed. And my job was gone and I was living my dream and it was awesome because every day I got to wake up and work with bands. And it was cool, and a band that I liked, and genres that I like, and it was so exciting. But then something else happened. You know, I was married, and, you know, I had my first kid, and then a reality check hit me. There's this big B word that everybody uses called balance. And uh, anybody married in here? You know what I'm talking about. You're sitting in your studio, and your significant other's like, yo, it's 5 o'clock, when are you going to be home? You're like, oh, I just got to do these notes. 11.30 at night comes along. You know, I've been waiting for you since 5 o'clock. When are you going to come home? So I started running into this problem because I'm a workaholic and I love what I do. I love working and I love my, what, my studio and I just, there's, there's something about it. You know what I'm talking about. That's why you're all here. You have this certain passion for music and that's how you communicate with the world. So I was working crazy, crazy, crazy hours just beating myself. And there was a point where I was working, I would say on average, 12 to 16 hours a day. Sometimes the worst I ever did was two and a half months straight, 16 hours a day. Imagine doing that. That's like wake up in your studio couch, don't even have time to coffee, sit down and go uh, over the keyboard for 16 hours, you know, maybe like call Uber Eats. We didn't have that back then. You know, like send your assistant to go get food, you know, sleep on the couch and then, you know, call home and be like, sorry, I got I to gotta catch up. I'm so behind. Because, you know, music, it's like this, you know, like you're busy and then you take on a bunch of work and then, you know, because sometimes you're dead and you're down a little bit and you're, you know, you want to kind of hedge. So you want to try to make as most money as possible. Well, I say yes to everything because, you know, I, I just, I like taking on work and of course I think I can handle it. So then something happened to me and this is the part that sucked. I realized I was killing my marriage I was ruining the relationship with my child. We can't even speak yet, so I guess she already forgot about that stuff. And I'm just like, I'm a, terrible, I'm a terrible spouse and I'm a terrible parent because I'm never there. So I'm making the money, but what I'm not doing is I'm not balancing my life. I'm not giving my spouse what she needs. And that sucks. But I needed the money because, you know, you put three kids in daycare, at least where I live, that's like 34000 bucks a year. You know, that's, that's a nice chunk of money. I mean, things are a little bit more expensive out here in NYC than they are in Wisconsin to live. But... It's, it's just expensive, you know? So you're working really hard, and it's like all I was doing was working. I was successful. 
but I was a slave to my business. My business was running me. I was not running my business. And that is a terrible feeling to feel like you cannot get out. So then I had a breaking point. And this is the point that changed my life because I was sitting there one night at 1.30 in the morning and I had a bar outside of my studio. And like, it's Saturday night. And I'm sitting there at 1.30 running mixed revisions and I'm like ragged, like just drooling out of my mouth like this is horrible. And I hear people having something I haven't done in a long time called fun across the street. And I look out the window, I'm like, damn, I want to go do that. That sounds, that sounds cool. Like, people, people have lives. I just work. That's all I've done for the last decade is sit and work. I'm like, wow. So then I had a realization. How can I make more money working less? Because that would have solved all my problems. And then, my friends, was the aha moment. Because that day, I sat down and started systematizing everything in my business and deconstructing it. And this is what I'm going to teach you some of today. And I destroyed every workflow thing all the way from like, how can I move the mouse from here to here? I don't want to do that anymore. That's too long. That's a few seconds. And if I do that 300 times a day, you know, or here I did some math. I'm like, if you can cut 30 minutes of time off of your workday, you can improve your speed. I feel like I can improve any of your speed in here by at least 30 minutes if you gave me a week of one-on-one -on -one with you. Easily. No problem. If you listen to this stuff, you could shave, ha you know, half the time off your mixing just like that. I've seen it happen. I've trained it. I've done it. It's proven. So... I'm thinking to myself, like, 30 minutes a day is like three weeks a year. Guys, it's, every, it's a vacation, a free vacation for just being more efficient. I'm like, I'm doing everything wrong. So that was it. And then I got twice as fast, three times as fast, and in a couple of years I was mixing five times faster. But something interesting happened. Not only was I mixing faster, I was mixing better. I st people st my demand went like this, the amount of projects I could do. There was times I've, you know, I've mixed over 60 songs a month, and I've just knocked it out. On average, I was doing over 500 songs a year, no problem. And, you know, it was nice to have a pay raise and be able to take your kids to the zoo at the same time and have a life. So this changed my life. Maybe it can change yours. And I had that realization one day, and now I'm on a mission to bring it to other people and to share all the things that have taken me an entire decade of my life to figure out and that I have struggled with to people. Because there's somebody out there who's struggling. Maybe you just want to quit your day job and you only have an hour a day to do audio. And you want to go out and you want to turn that hour a day into a career, but you're, you're pinned down, you know, you've got obligations and things like that. How do you do that? Well, you work faster and more efficiently. Maybe you want to, you're a pro and you're just buried and you can barely keep up. Boom. Maybe you need more clients and you're a pro, but you're kind of slow. Well, you need more time to acquire clients. Good. Boom. Let's speed you up so now you can spend more time acquiring them. It works. So, everybody up. We need to retain this information. Let's go. Jump in. Come on. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. My mic? Oh, no, I'm still here. Good. Okay. Now I need you to retain this information because this is going to go in depth and there's a lot of stuff here and I hope you're ready to work hard. I'm going to teach you today speed mixing hack number one, how to develop templates that will change your life and workflow. Number two, how to define your focus, meaning what you focus on when you are actually mixing matters. Believe it or not, I'll explain. That probably didn't sound too convincing, but I promise you, you're going to understand it. Number three, I'm going to show you how to systematize client interaction, which will make mixed notes so much better. And number four, I'm going to show you how to hack your EQ speed. So you can just be like, next, 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 next. You just zip through your whole session and be like, boom, done. And people will be like, whoa. And you're like, I trained that, like a gamer. OK, speed mixing hack number one. What if I told you that you can create a set of templates and standardized mix moves that will do 80% of the mix for you in literally minutes, not hours? Now, I already know, I can already see there's going to be somebody that objects to this, and I'm going to hit that in a second. So hear me out on this if you're like anti-template, and you just want like, whoa, 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 whoa. With very few exceptions, it is a complete waste of time to reinvent the mix wheel and start from scratch because lots of standard mix elements are there regardless of the song. Seriously, like if you're, you know, if you always record metal bands, you probably have a guitar bus. So why not have it set up? You probably have a high pass filter on that guitar bus, maybe at 100 hertz. Why not already have that set up? What does that have to do with art? It has nothing to do with art. That is a technical process. Most mixers think that every mix has to be custom and from scratch to be good. Very, very common mix conception. Because it's predicated on one thing, that more time equals higher quality. And my friends, believe it or not, more time does not always equal higher quality. Fight me on this. Let me explain. In economics, we call it 
Diminishing marginal utility. Anybody ever take econ in here? Okay, well you, got, you guys know what I'm talking about. So it's, a, it's a, like a curve that goes like that, a picture of bell curve. You know, let's talk about pizza. This is the best way to understand this. So you have one piece of pizza and you're like, damn, that was good, I'm hungry, I'm gonna have a second, right? Second piece of pizza. I hear New York's got good pizza, yeah? So you know, second piece of pizza, you're like, yeah, that was, that was really good, I'm gonna have three. By that third, you're like, you know, I could have four, but I'm starting to get a little full. You have that fourth piece of pizza, you're like, damn. Now you have that fifth piece of pizza, and you, that pizza starts tasting really bad, and you start getting sick. Then you have that sixth piece of pizza, and you're like, oh my God, I feel like I'm going to die. And then you have that seventh, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to the bathroom. So um, think about mixing like that. Has anybody in here ever started mixing a song? And you get into the vibe, and you're like, oh boy, this is really exciting. This sounds great. And then all of a sudden, your brain turns on. And then you're like, oh. I referenced this track, and my bass doesn't sound the same, even though it's a totally different band that's in a different key, mixed by a different mixer and a different producer, recorded in, you know, who knows what guitar setup or whatever. And you follow, you start chasing people's mixes, or you start overthinking what you're doing. And then you're like, oh, I gotta tweak this. I gotta, I gotta dial this in. And then what happens? Your mix kind of goes sideways, and then like an hour or two pass, and you're frustrated, and you're not getting any better. What you're doing is you're just changing things and making it sideways. And then maybe like a whole day or two goes by, and you're tweaking it all week, and the mix maybe gets a half percent better. But sometimes it gets worse. You just wasted all that time. There's a point where you're going to start mixing, and you're going to do your best work, and it's going to be amazing. And then there's a point where that's going to slow down, and you're going to start way overthinking stuff and making things sound worse. We've all done this. Who's done this in here? Absolutely you have. We've all, mixing is tough. It's hard, it's frustrating. But you gotta know when to turn it off. So look, more time does not always equal higher quality. Yes, sometimes more time equals higher quality. And um, yes, sometimes it does not. It depends. You gotta know when is the right time to get out. Because look, I like to think about it like this. One time I spent three days getting this drum sound. I'm like, this is the best drum sound I'd ever done in my life. And I was so excited to show the band. I'm doing metal, so we use samples. So don't, don't stab me if you don't like drum samples. So I sent it to the band, and I'm like, this mix is awesome. Drummer's like, dude, these drums suck. I wanted a piccolo snare, and this trigger, everything is wrong. I wanted it to sound like this and that, and then I'm like, I just wasted three days of my life. Back to square one. That happens. So now I'm like, okay, this is how I interpret the song. I need to get it to the client as fast as possible because actual mixing does not start on the first mix. Actual mixing starts when you get the first mix to the client and they give you that F word, feedback. Because until then, you're just guessing, we're flying blind, we don't know what we're doing until our client comes back and they hit us with feedback. So, we need to get to that stage as fast as possible while turning in a terrific first mix. That is the cutoff point, that is the key. Okay, common objections to templates. So I would talk to you about, I'm gonna address these. I'm gonna show you why they're wrong. But what about giving each artist their own unique sound? Like, seriously, is anybody actually against that? I mean, maybe there's a few people that are, okay. I don't use templates because they destroy the creativity in the mix. I love that, so that's my favorite. I'm laughing because I'm thinking like, I'm giving you templates and showing you how to do this so you can have more time for creativity. But okay, we'll explain that in a second. And isn't every band gonna sound the same? I'm like, why would you wanna make every band sound the same? We are mixers, we are creating art, we are not creating cookies that have to go to a distributor and show up in a store and have to be consistent. We're not making McDonald's hamburgers. Now, some mixers, they like to do that, and that's fine, and that's what some bands want. If that's what your bands want and your artists, that's great, do it. A lot of my bands, like metalcore bands, you're only allowed to use like four different kick samples, or else like kids will destroy you on the internet, come to your house and beat you up for like putting out a bad mix. It's, it's literally to that, to that point. So some genres are like that, which is okay. So look, when it comes to those objections, you need to understand, I am trying to take things out of your workflow and templatize things. We're going to show you here in a second. Um, I'm going to take things out of your workflow, which waste time, so we can focus on one thing, and that is being more creative. We want to spend more time being creative and no time being technical. Okay, we'll talk about the two hemispheres of the brain in a second. So you need to stop wasting your creative energy on repetitive, trivial tasks when you could be using it on applying your creative point of view to the mix. Why would you not templatize stuff like routing, gain structuring, you know, Bouncing stems, alternate mix revisions, and live tracks. You're gonna do that stuff in every mix. You know how many hours of my life I wasted setting up guitar buses and drum buses that I was just gonna do on every time I mix or like when I track a band? I mean, it's so much easier to just have it set up and then be like, all right, I'm recording drums and boom, push one button. And then I've got all my drum recording templates sitting there and okay, cool, I need to add a tom. Oh, that took 10 seconds, great. It's so much easier to do that. So you, Mr. 
I hate templates because they're sucking the art out of music. <laughs> Giving the artist a unique sound takes a lot of time and a lot of energy, doesn't it? We all agree. So you might as well free up as much of that time as possible because I don't want to sit down and mix and like start getting into the vibe of a song. And then suddenly, I'm rocking it, and I'm like, oh, I'm on a 10, you know, a passion into the song. I'm so into it. And then suddenly, something happens. I'm like, oh, i got to set up this parallel compression thing on my drums. Hold on. Five minutes later, you're like, all right, now you're on like a 7 of excitement. You're like, all right, now I'm ready to mix this. You start mixing again, you're like, oh, i got to do this routing thing, and i got to load up some effects buses, and i you know, I got to bring in this quarter note delay because I didn't listen to Joel, and i got to bring in this reverb you know, that I used like three months ago, and then you load all these plugins, and now you're on a three of excitement because you've wasted an hour of time setting up stuff that could already have been set up in your mix, and you could just be like, do I like this? Yes or no? Do I like this? Yes or no? Do I like this? Yes or no? How about we combine these two things? It's not a technical thing. So look, your brain, my friends, has two hemispheres. You have the left side, which is technical and analytical. Think like math and science and stuff, right? And then the right side, which is like artsies, you know, artsy and like creative and musical. When we are mixing, we do not want to do anything technical. You always need to separate your technical tasks from creative tasks before you start. This will change your life because if you sit and prep in the same thing, you are not going to be excited 10 out of 10 times every time you sit down to start mixing. I have an assistant. Not everybody is fortunate enough to have one, but at some point it is really incredible to have one because I sit down and listen to the song for 10 seconds and I'm like, I want this, 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 this. He takes an interlocking system of templates which we'll go over, and he builds me my mix template. And then, when I hit play and I hear it for the first time, I'm like, all right, I am 100% in the creative mode when I am mixing, and I am not doing anything technical. I don't have to set up any buses, check any gain structuring, do any routing. It's all set up for me, because you never want to interrupt your gut instinct when you are mixing ever, because think about it like this. All right, so has anybody ever recorded a band? And you're coming in, you've got like a tracking, kind of like rough thing, and then you get down to mixing, and you're like, now I'm going to show this band. Watch this. Reset everything to zero. They're like, now I'm really going to mix this. And you're like, you know, puffing out your chest. You're like, I'm going to show this band what's up. And you sit down, and you start mixing. You're like 20 minutes into, you're like, you know, it sounded better when I had like the working rough tracking mix. Has anybody ever done that? A few of you? You guys got to mix more songs. I'm telling you, like, that happens. So many times where I've been tracking something, and I've been like, I had a way better fader balance going when I was doing that. Now, why? What? what, what? I, it should be better now. Now I'm mixing. Well, I did a cardinal sin. I did not separate the technical from creative. So that's what we want to do with templates. If I had to mix a song from scratch, it'd take me like four times longer. It's such a buzzkill because I mix a lot of songs and work on a very high level. And for me, at my level, it's all about speed and consistency, right? So, you know, when you're a student, you've got six months to work on a song. As long as you want. If you're in a band and you're working on your own music, you have forever to write your first record. Now, when you're a touring band or a professional mixer, sometimes the band write, you know, gets off a tour. They write the band in the studio with the producer. They got, you have three days to mix the record with revisions. And mind you, this happened to me this week, actually. Um, I had a record that was due Monday. I got the vocals files. And I'm talking like 50 tracks a song, really complicated stuff by an incredible singer. We're not talking about like, you know, three tracks of vocals. I got six songs worth of vocals at 7 a.m. and it was due at 5 p.m. Monday. And I was like, you're kidding me. The DDP turned in and done Monday. Well, it got turned in slightly behind, but I still made it. That's what it's like being a professional. Like people come in and they throw you something. They're like, okay, I need this turned around in two hours because I got I to gotta catch a plane. And you're like, two hours. You didn't even label your tracks right. Two hours. All right. You know, you don't complain. You smile and you knock it out and you show them and then they keep coming back to you. So, Let's talk about actually making templates. I think you guys understand the theory now. So here are powerful things to templatize. First off, routing. Depending on the type of genre you're doing, um, it's, you're going to set things up a certain way. You're going to develop a workflow over time, OK? So I know if I'm mixing a metal song, there's going to be a rhythm guitar bus. There's probably going to be lead guitars, maybe a guitar solo. Maybe there's going to be a bass. You know, there's going to be drum shells. There's going to be cymbals. There's going to be an instrumental. Like, I know this stuff. A hundred out of a hundred times, I'm going to have these things in my session. And even if something is not, like, say, I have a metal song without guitars in it, what a sin, right? Like, that's not metal. Um, there's always one of those songs on the record. Um, in that situation, I can just hit delete. It's much faster to delete than it is to set it up. So um, 
though, that's a fantastic thing to set up. Next would be exporting alternate revisions in a single pass. This is another thing that changed my life. It goes like this. You, 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 know, you mix the whole album. You're like, oh, wow, that was a lot of work. And then the band comes back seven months later. They're like, yo, bro, stems, live tracks. And you're like, oh, yeah, sorry. They updated their thing, and that plugin doesn't load anymore. And you know, my DAW has updated itself, and like, this is different. And I got to go pull that session off a hard drive. Why not just do it in one pass? With, you know, literally takes one mix pass the way I've got it. This is why I like Cubase. They have this amazing batch export function that is incredible. And I'm going to show you how to set up a busting system here in a second uh, where you can literally push one button and have all of your mixes. Your mix, acapella, instrumental, all of your stems, boom, in two and a half minutes, you've exported all of that stuff and nicely and organized into a folder. And then when the band calls you five years later and says, yo, bro, I got a DJ friend who wants to remix this song, you're like, yo, bro, here you go. What's your email? Done. Have a nice day. Thank you. No problems. Instead of, oh my God, where did I put that hard drive? What am I going to do? This doesn't plug in, doesn't load. Oh my God, this was freeware and this company's out of business and they don't, it's not even supported by the new version. It doesn't do the new, uh, you know, it, they didn't make an AAX version. What am I going to do? See how many problems that saves by being organized ahead of the game? Another thing that's great is gain structuring, and I'll go into this in detail here in a little bit. Gain structuring is something that takes a lot of time, and this will take you some time to develop. You are not going to wake up in the morning and figure out every compressor you're going to put on the mix, regardless of any artistic inclinations you have. Like, look, every time I mix, I know what limiter I'm going to put on the guitars 10 out of 10 times, because I've had 15 years of my life to figure that out, and it's not going to change, and I keep trying to beat it, but so I already, why not already have it in your template? So I work like this. I have my mix over here, and it comes off of my drum bus, my kick drum level. Once that thing is hitting my drum bus doing one or two dB of reduction, it then is gain structured perfectly to go to my master bus. And again, I'll show you this in detail, some charts here in a second. Um, it hits my master at minus six, and then immediately I have my mastering chain on, so I'm hitting at minus four RMS in ozone, or if I'm using Slate FGX uh, as a mastering limiter, it would be hitting about minus eight. Eight. They're about the same level, but they have different way metering algorithms, at least in my experience. So um, I don't need to change the level of my kick drum. I can build that up. You know, I have all the limiters, for example, on my guitars, my, you know, my synths, pianos, vocals, whatever I'm using, and everything gains structures for my stuff. So it's already balanced and level with an, a dB without even touching a single EQ, without even, you know, all I need to do is clip gain things. It's amazing. It saves so much time. And if you take the time to develop a template that allows you to do that, again, you have to know which tools you're going to use on what to be able to do this. But once you do that, it's life-changing because, you know, for example, if we're talking metal, I know that, let's say I've got 10 different kick drums that I've made that are going to be a starting point for my sample stack. And I can just be like, boom, I can load them in and I can very quickly, my assistant sets it up, so be like, they're like A, B, C, oh, D sounds great. F, G, uh, F and D sound incredible. I can shoot about them and be like, D is the one for this song that vibes the best. Let's jam it in and get it, let's, let's massage it a little bit, and boom, it's there. See, I didn't have to go in and load up Trigger and go through and find all the samples. It's already there. I just tell them, I'm like, I want this, 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 and this in the session. Boom, Legos, you put it together. It's great. Okay, anytime you make a cool tone, um, if you work in music with guitars and bass and stuff, you, you know, you should save that stuff, like DI. So, for example, maybe we, we're using, like, Pod Farm or something like that, and somebody creates a cool guitar tone, and then you need, like, a metal guitar tone, or you need, like, a, you know, a you know, like a boxy, like uh, surf guitar tone or something like that for a certain part in a song, you could be like, oh, cool, I can just load that tone preset. Oh, no, I got three of them, and ooh, number two sounds great. Let me tweak that and make it adjust and fit the song. You see how much time this stuff saves? It's better to audition because you're being creative than it is to start and build from scratch every single time. Now, obviously, like I said, you have to build from scratch for a certain amount of time before you can automate it. But, so I always save that stuff. Anytime I create like a cool bass sound, a cool guitar sound, a cool drum sample stack, or effects, that's another thing. So you're in a session, you're like, oh, I got the coolest lo-fi delay, you know, parallel compressed distorted thing I've ever made. This is really exciting. I'm gonna save that so I can be like, and just leave it in my template. So next time I'm mixing and I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have that effect there? I'm just gonna slide this down to that channel and oh, boom, there it is. That sounds dope. So much more fun than sitting there for seven minutes and being like, what plugin was that? Oh, I gotta go open that session and I gotta go find it on the hard drive. I gotta plug it in. See how much time that saves? You can see how this stuff really changed my life because I wasn't doing any of these things back then. And now I, now I, I live and die by this stuff. Um, like I said, drum sample stacks. And some mixers even take their last mix and use it as a template for their next one. I've got a very good friend who's a superstar in Nashville. His name is Billy Decker. And Billy mixed 
Um, he said at his, you know, his best year, he mixed over 1,500 songs. Billy's got 14 number ones to his name. I mean, that's pretty undisputable. Anybody, anybody in here got more than 10 number ones? Didn't think so. I only have one number one song that I've mixed. So that's a pretty incredible feat for him. And uh, Billy, he works with like a couple of different producers in Nashville, and they all cut everything the same way because they're using the same session musicians and they're writing. So like when Rodney Atkins walks in and it's done by this producer, he already knows that like this guy records steel like this, he records fiddle like this, and banjo, I'm going to mute that mic, I'm going to use this one. He has, a, he has templates for every one of these producers. He just loads up and boom, his mix is already rocking, it's gain structured, it's organized, and boom, he's through that thing in like 45 minutes and it's off to the band for notes and then mixing begins and he knocks it out and boom, you mix 1,500 songs in a year. And, uh, you know, he's doing really well. Very, very, very wonderful person. Very great guy. Love him to death. So that's another example of this taken to an extreme, just to give you guys an idea of how far you can take it. Okay, so for you out there watching, if you do not know where to start with templates, because this is intimidating stuff, like I give you the, you know, the stuff. First thing you want to do is create a basic busing template. Take, like, the 10 things that you know you're going to have, you know, maybe, like, even if it's just gross stuff, like, make a instrumental bus, make a vocal bus so you can print an a cappella, you know, that kind of stuff. Just create a basic template for busing. Next, you want to put high pass filters on your templates because if you've mixed for more than a year, you probably have a good idea of where you're going to use your high pass 90% of the time. And it's better to have it loaded and just tweak it and be like, well, okay, most of the time I'm going to start my vocal one at 200. Sometimes if the singer's really low like this, I wish I had a low voice like that. Um, I could just pull it back. So I'd rather open the plugin and pull it back than go and decide, well, do I want to use the uh, fab filter on this one? Or do I want to use the high pass in uh, Cubase? Or do I want to come in and uh, maybe try this like, you know, crazy one I heard about? Or you know what I mean? Like it's so much easier to just have it on and just be like, sounds good. All right, a little adjustment. It saves you time. So start there. Routing and busing and filters. Approximately in the ballpark where you're going to use them. Start there and grow. Now, if you want to level up in your template game, next thing you do is this. You're going to put your two or three favorite compressors on each instrument and have them gain structured for quick auditioning, OK? So guitars, well, I guess, I, I guess it's a bad example. So I'll use waves. I have my own set of compress compressors that I've made through Joey Sturgis Tones. Um, but before I used my own plugins that I developed, I basically, I would do something like L1, you know, and then I would have the, the, uh, the 3A, the LA3A on the guitar. So I would always have the L1 and the 3A back when I was auditioning. I'd be, they'd be gain structured perfectly. So all I had to do is clip gain my guitar and be like, do I want the 3A or the L1? Which sounds better today in this mix? And after a while, I'm like, okay, L1 is that to my ear wins 10 out of 10 times. So I'm just going to do that. So you know what I mean? So have a couple where you can just quickly audition and be like, which drum brush compressor do I want? These are my three favorite. But if they're gain structured the same way, meaning you know, you're hitting the buses um, and the output is the same, so you're not changing your levels, you can get an accurate comparison lightning fast. And then again, you're being musical. You're not setting it up. You don't have to worry about attack and release. Hopefully you figured that out by now. And you've got your attack and release times the same and dialed in for each one. You've got a gain structure the same. You can be like, do I like A, B, or C? See, that's a creative decision. It's not a technical decision. You're not breaking your flow. You're in the vibe. Okay, so after that, you can place your favorite EQ on the channel. Now you stock Cubase EQ. I love that thing. It's incredible. It's so fast. I don't like anything else. Um, you know, I have a few EQs that I'd use on certain things, but 90% of the time I'm using stock EQ. So having that open, if you use like Fab Filter or one of like the cool popular EQs that, you know, has a like really cool graphic interface or whatever, some people like that stuff, have that loaded already. It could be set to flat, it doesn't matter. But at least if it's loaded, you don't have to worry about like, all right, where is it in the plugin list because it's this deep in vendors and I got to go down this tree and oh, 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 yep, there it is. Found it. Oh, boy, I just looked at 400 names. What was I doing again? That happens. We've all done that. And then effects templates. Like I said, you know, you might as well make one if you're going to have a quarter note delay, an eighth note delay, a 16th, a 32nd. If you're going to use, you know, four or five different types of reverb, maybe you want a haul, you want a plate. Doesn't it make sense to have all that stuff already in your session? Like, this is my favorite haul reverb. I may use it on the session, I may not. Oh, I'm doing pop vocals today. See, I mix a lot of different stuff. So I've got my template set up where I can mix any genre, whether it's metal or pop, and it's the same template. So I'm like, yo, what do I need? I'm doing hip hop today. Yo, what do I need? I'm doing death metal. And I can just be like, boom, do I like it? Yes or no? Boom, do I like it? Yes or no? Oh, that's the one. Cool. I ain't got to set that stuff up. It saves time. All right, here we go. Here's the routing template. 
And I could show you this stuff on a DAW, but let's be honest. I'm a PC, Windows, Cubase guy, and I have a Mac. I bought it because it integrated with my iPhone. I thought it'd be smart. They got that option key that would, that would kill me. So I'm going to show you a chart because, look, me telling you about something and showing you is nowhere near as powerful as you doing it. Okay? You have to do it. This is the most important thing. I can tell you about this stuff, but if you do not go home and you do not make this for yourself and start employing it, you're wasting your time. And so am I. So let's start on the right here. Now, this is for like a rock and metal track, okay? So if we're doing pop, if you're doing hip hop, you're going to have different stuff, but the principles are the same. So let's talk about the principles. Over here on my right, or uh, your left side, we have the guitar buses. So I'm going to have a rhythm guitar and like a rock song for sure. You know, acoustic guitars possibly, definitely probably some lead guitars, and is there a guitar solo or solos? Now you can route, you can have sub buses and things like that. But again, you know, we want to be able to kick out stems like, hey, dude, I need all my rhythm guitars for live tracks. Hey, dude, um, I need all my rhythm guitar tracks, or can you just solo the right side? So you can very quickly knock out the stems. And then that's going to go to a group called guitars. Maybe we want to do something like a pitch shutdown that goes on the guitars in a certain drop, and, you know, or put a bit crusher and have them go and like fizzle out or something like that. It's a lot easier to do that when you can just do it on a group and everything's routed there already. You don't have to think about it. So, boom, everything's lined up. Then we got a bass bus. Moving on to drums down here. So we have a shells bus, which is cool because I like putting a bus compressor on my shells, my kick, my snare, my toms, okay? If we're doing like EDM, hip hop, you know, that would be like your loops, that would be, you know, your kick, your claps, your snaps, like whatever's in that week, it changes every week. Um, cymbals, rooms, if you're using real drums, and then that goes to a drum bus. Maybe you want to have a lo-fi section or a cool effect with some reverb on it, and it's so much easier to automate that drum bus, which is already set up for you, and just run some sends off of that than it is to go and kike all those tracks, create a drum bus, load the right reverb. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to save you time and redundancy that you're going to do over and over and over. Anytime we do a task more than like 10 to 20 times, you should probably think about putting it in your template. And this is going to evolve, I should say, over your entire life. I mean, I'm still tweaking mine. Billy Decker, my buddy I was talking about, he's still tweaking his, you know, and we've been, we've been template nerds for years. So it's going to happen. All right, so come over here to vocals. So vocals will have like our main vocals. Now, you might even want to subgroup this to like verse vocals, chorus group, you know, vocals, but your main vocals, you know, your harmony stacks. So I usually, I usually go as far as to take each group of harmonies or each pair, like do we have a minor third, do we have an octave, you know, et cetera, and give them their own bus. Uh, any gang vocals, super important in metal. You can't have a tough beat down riff without a bunch of dudes chanting like, get in the pit, you know, like, it's, it's, that's super important. Metal, metal kids are going to be really mad at me when they see this. Um, <laughs> then they're backing vocals. So all of the guitars and the bass and drums go to this instrumental bus. Then that goes to a mix bus where the vocals come in. Now, there's a difference. This is why I have this. You can very quickly pop out an instrumental, but there may be a point where you want to throw your vocals in and have an unmastered mix. Because the two bus is where you put your mastering or your Fox mastering, so you can at least see what it's going to sound like. You know, Because you, obviously, you want to turn in a, a mix with a limiter on it so it's loud enough. Don't we all love the loudness wars? Uh, so it's competitive, because when eight other people do a mix off and you're trying to knock off an A-list person to become A-list someday, if your mix is quieter, the A&R guy is going to be like, why does this mix suck so much? He'll be like, dude, turn it up. you got a volume knob. And he's going to be like, what? How does that thing work? Trust me on this. I know from experience. Don't ever turn in a mix that isn't just as loud as everybody you're competing with, despite all the elitism over, you know, oh, well, we're going to knock down the loudness wars. It still exists, okay? I don't make the rules, but I have to play by them and compete with them every day, so, so do all of you. So when that changes, I'll change, but in the meantime, throw a limiter on your two bus so you can hear what damage a limiter may or may not be doing to your mix, and you can be like, oh, I've got my snare a little bit too hot, it's going, it sounds good in the mix, but when I go through the limiter, it's knocking it down and it's killing the transient and it's not exciting, so maybe I'm going to adjust that a little bit. So when it gets to the mastering person, we have a better estimate. So right now, I can print all of my stems for the entire record like that. So I highly recommend you go home immediately today and you create some sort of template. All right, now the really technical stuff. There's less boxes up here, but this is a lot more complicated. This is how I set up my templates. And again, uh, I'll show you a little video here well, to give you an example of what the end goal is. It, it's pointless for me to go through and show you every little nook and cranny of how I do it because I'm not you. Your workflows are going to be different than mine. So what's more important here is the concept, the idea, 
of this and not, well, you have to route this to here and copy this to here and name this this. Like, I'm not, I don't want to teach you how to be robots. You need to think. You have your own creative spin. That's what makes this a beautiful art that's fun. So what I do is this. Everything starts with my kick drum, which goes to my drum bus. I have a compressor there that I'm hitting 2 dB gain reduction. And it's outputted and gain structured in a way where it then goes to my master bus, where it is hitting minus 6 dB peak. So no matter what drum sample, whether I'm doing death metal and I'm sampling my own stuff off acoustic drums or if I'm mixing pop, R&B, whatever, whatever comes in, my kick drum hits my master bus at minus 6 every single time, regardless. Then that goes to my mastering chain, which I already got Ozone or FTX on, depending on what the type of sound I want. Um, ozone to me is more aggressive, and I use a lot of the heavier stuff. FGX is like when I have something that I want that to be a little bit more open and not as like in your face and like really, you know, so those are the same level in my experience. So, you know, then I have it hitting a certain, so like all I got to do is turn on my mix for my assistant and it's already like mastered and hitting the compressors right. And usually I only have to tweak it just that much, if at all. And it's pretty cool because then I have everything else. I have limiters on every single channel, whether I limit or not with the output set for a ballpark balance to the master bus. Because if I'm doing a, a metal track, I know I'm going to hit those guitars 1 to 3 dB of reduction. And I want it to kick out at a certain level against my kick drum. So all I need to do, eh, it needs to come up a dB because the guitars are or, you know, down a little bit. The guitars are a little bit bassy. So all I need to do, my assistant comes in and he clip gains every single thing that I'm doing to hit the limiters at the right spot. So I'm always doing the right amount of compression that I want to do in limiting on every single track. All I need to do when I mix, I literally open up the track, and it's already mixed, and some part, you know, it's filtered, it's routed. All I need to do is EQ, balance, and focus on the big picture creative stuff, like does this drum sound work with the guitars and bass, and stuff like that. That's power, and that's how I mix songs in 30 to 50 minutes for a first mix, most of the time, not always. Sometimes you get those 200 track sessions that are like, they just break every template you have. But, this stuff saves you time. Now, this is an extreme. You, my friends, do not need to take your mixing to that level of, of craziness. Um, this is how a lot of like top people do it. Like this is how dialed in our templates. So, you know, you go mix with somebody like CLA. I mean, he's got every compressor set exactly how he wants it. All he's got to do is throw up the faders and be like, boom, mix. How what EQ does this need? You know, because again, we want to get that mix turned around in like a couple hours. You know, we want to get notes. I want to I want to have the mix done before lunch. Okay, so I can then mix the rest of the record and get going because there's a deadline in two days. Or I got the vocals on Monday at 7 a.m. and I have to now mix six songs before the end of the day. And I'm going, oh, that's not fair. Okay, I'm going to play a little video here. Bear with me, hopefully the tech works, where I show you uh, off the templates. This is going to be about three minutes long. I'm going to show you guys what one of my metalcore song templates sounds like. So when a band sends me a mix, this has now gone through my assistant, and this is what my mix starts out with before I even mix. So let's head over and listen. So my assistant has gone through and painstakingly triggered all the drums. Um, if they weren't triggered, marked everything up, color-coded everything, routed everything, popped everything in my template. You can see there's extra vocal tracks and things like that that he left in case I want to move things into different positions if I want like a certain effect or something. It's all here. It's all laid out in a way that makes perfect sense. Now, this is what my stuff sounds like before, for this genre, this style of template, before I even start mixing it. It's pretty damn good. Like it doesn't need a lot of work. You know, like the symbols are a little out in the rooms, but you'll notice we remember we talked about gain structuring your compressors and things like that. If you come over to the master bus here, and I think I have just a simple uh, master chain, and sometimes I'll audition different master chains and things like that. Um, if I open up the mix bus compressor, it's already hitting exactly where I want it to. And he hasn't touched a single volume or a single fader other than doing whatever clip gain he's needed to do to get it to hit the compressors at the certain level. If I come over to my mastering limiter here. I'm already hitting exactly where I want to be hitting. So I haven't even started mixing. I haven't moved a fader. I haven't touched an EQ. There's already EQs. There's already compressors. There's already 
every single plugin that I'm going to use in this session, in this session. Everything's already got filters on it. All I need to do essentially is start balancing, do a little bit of EQ, maybe change or tweak a drum sample, whatever, depending on my aesthetic. But this just goes to show you like, this is what a good template looks like. So um, I think he's even got some uh, free balance on some of these synths. Yeah, so everything's already kind of ballparked in for me, and I haven't even started mixing. It's so cool. Clean vocals are already dialed in and sound great. Screaming. We need a little bit of EQ and a little work, but again, after I recorded this, or sorry, mixed this song, I would shoot out another template version of him for him, specifically dialed in for this mix. And then he would take it and everything would be like perfectly cued. And then I would start out from even a stronger point than I already am. So there you go. This is how good your template needs to be. It needs to be able to, no matter what you throw at it, open up a song and it's mixed. It sounds good. Then all I got to do is slide the corresponding stem into the correct lane and convert MIDI if you need to or whatever. Th throw your MIDI into the correct channels and you're ready to go. All right. So... That is templates. Everybody stand up real quick. Let's get some energy going. Come on. It's a lot of stuff to chew on. A lot of information, yeah? We're going to make templates when we go home? Come on, jump. Jump. Shake it up. You may sit. <laughs> we got we to get the brain going. It's early. I mean, these, these seminars are, are tough because you got to sit through it all day long, and there's a lot of information, and it's overwhelming. So I want to help you try to retain as much of this information as possible. OK, enough about templates. Let's move on to defining your focus. So there's a massive misconception that a lot of people have when mixing is that every single element in the mix requires the same amount of attention. So fill in the blank here, but has anybody ever done this? You're mixing and you're like, if I just spend 30 more minutes dialing in and tweaking this snare, that's what's gonna drive this mix home and make it awesome. Anybody ever done something like that? It could be guitar, a vocal. You know what I'm talking about. Don't ever do that again, please. Instead, do this. There is a funnel of mixing priorities that I'm going to give you in a second. And the more you know it, the more effective you're going to be. And what you should do is what's called the Pareto Principle, because mixing is a 90-10 game. And I just showed you how to do 80% of your mix without actually even starting to mix, because we're getting rid of all the prep and all the technical stuff. Now I'm going to give you that other 10%. Pareto Principle works like this. Anybody ever hear of 80-20? Some of you? OK, there's a famous Italian economist named Vilfredo Pareto. And he uh, figured out that 20% of his tomato plants created 80% of his yield. And he went, wow. And then he starts studying it and realized that there's all types of um, effort. So you need to know what the 20, in this case, 10% of work that you can do, that's going to get you 90% of the way there. So you get to start off at 90%. So aside from templatizing a bunch of things and getting all the technical stuff out of our life, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on the things that actually matter when we're mixing. And this is a hard thing to understand. So what do I mean? I'm going to give you two funnels to help you visualize how a mix should be prioritized. Meaning, when you hit play as a listener, what's going to impress the person listening to the song? you got to think about the end user, OK? Like, look, audio nerds are audio nerds. Like, when we go to listen to a mix, we're like, oh, snare. It needs a 0.6 dB with a Q width of 1.2 at 8K because it's a little bit, um, I don't know, it just needs a little bit more snap. You're like, you play, the, here, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> One time I, I, I feel like I did my best mix this many years ago and I went to visit my parents and I saw my mom, I'm like, mom, check out this mix. I was so pumped about it. I thought this was my best work. She listens to it and be like, oh, good song. I'm like, mom, who cares about the song? Listen to the mix. Listen to the drums, the guitars, like the bass. This is slamming. And she's like, yeah, I like this song. I'm like, mom. Mom, she's like, yeah, I like the song. I'm like, what about the mix? She's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, how does it sound? She's like, well, yeah, it sounds good, but I really like the song. And I'm like, then I had the revelation. I was like, no one cares about the mix if you've done your job right. They hit play and they listen to the song. You're like, this is a great song. And my friends, that is how you know when you have an amazing mix. When you hit play, does it sound like a song? So the average person listening, they hit play and they're like, does it sound good? Yes or no? And if it sounds good, the next step is, do I like this song? Do I connect with it emotionally? Is this my mead? You know, my, you know, is this how I feel today? 
It's a, maybe it's a love song, maybe it's a fight song, maybe it's like a, a chill song and a vibe thing, you know, like maybe it makes you want to dance, whatever. That's what people care about. So we always need to keep that in mind as mixers because as much as we think our job matters, it doesn't if we prioritize incorrectly. So instead of this, I'm going to give you funnels. This is the most important thing. I chose a funnel because the biggest part, and it narrows down, meaning you should focus the most of your attention on that. This is the 90-10 stuff. I'm going to give you the order of elements in a mixed funnel and the order of processing in a mixed funnel. So take a look at this picture. How many people think the vocals are the most important in mix, thing in a mix in here? How many? Some of you? Good. You're almost right. I know. I just committed, like, mixing blasphemy. Allow me to explain before I get stones thrown at me. The vocals are almost the most important thing that are in a song because without a song, hello, you're just somebody sitting in a shower singing and them. Da, 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 da. No one cares. No one wants to listen to that. People want to listen to songs, at least today. So you need to have a song. So vocals, we'll give them like a almost. It's like, it's like the most important thing with an asterisk. What's ahead of that? The most important thing, my friends, is the bass, the beat, the groove, the rhythm, how things lock. That is what gives the song the energy. It's what makes people want to move and dance, it makes them want to, you know, mosh pit and do that dumb, silly stuff. It makes them want to, like, you know, do this at the club. You know, that's what makes people, you know, makes them want to do this in the middle school dance thing. You know, like... That's what happens. If we don't nail that part as a mixer, we have not nailed the mix. We have totally failed. It doesn't matter how good your vocal is. You could make your vocalist sound like a star. If your mix, this is how people will perceive it. If your beat is not fire, it's garbage. Restart. Try again. So you need to get that part right. Then you need to make your vocalist sound like a star. Hard to do with some vocalists. Maybe you've all seen American Idol. A lot of vocalists think they're a star. Only a few of them are, <laughs> unfortunately. But you got to try your best. And then it's a sustained instrument. So like things like, you know, do you have keys? Do you have roads? The stuff that gives it the melody, the chord movement, pianos, guitars. Maybe it's cello. Whatever it is in every song. Every genre has got its own take. But that's the stuff that makes a song interesting and makes it stand out, not just do, 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 you know, on the bottom end all day. So if you completely ignore everything else in a mix, this is what I call the instant play three-second test. And if you've nailed those three things, meaning you've got the beat sounding bad, you've got the vocals sounding on point, and the sustained instruments are on fire, guess what? You have a mix. My mom will hit play and be like, I like this song. My mom does not care if I wrote an automation at three minutes and 18 seconds on an S and brought it down 0.3 dB because it was slightly sibilant. Like, to me, that matters. To my mom, she's just like, oh, this is a great song. So you need to nail those three things before you even think about caring, you know, should I have my uh, background harmonies? Do I want a little bit more of the octave or the minor third in this? That's subjective. That, the top stuff, is not. If you have not nailed that, you do not have a mix, my friends, period. So after that, we're going to do like backing vocal stuff. Then we're going to do like automation, little detail work. By automation, I don't mean like balance automation, like telling the story with the song. That's part, you know, I, I attribute that up there. I mean like the little stuff like, oh, I'm going to DS this little thing or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to cut out this little tail here. So that, that's the kind of, you know, things like I've got 18 stacks of vocals. I'm going to cut out all the S's and just use the ones on the main. Like, you know, the detail work because there's too much in the track. So that stuff is important to some degree. But if you do not nail the top three things, you do not have a mix or mix sucks. Sorry. Restart. People like to focus on the details because the details are sexier, cooler, and more fun than the big picture. All right, now let's talk about the actual process of mixing. So the technical stuff. Now I have this thing called Nail the Mix. And what we do is I bring you the best rock and metal mixers in the world and the biggest bands. And you get to download the tracks. And every month we have a mixing competition. And I've got over 5,000 people subscribed to this from all over the world. We have a mixing competition. And then you know, we make a top 50, then a top 20, and then our users select which they think is the best mix. And after judging thousands, and I mean thousands of mixes, because I've been doing this for two and a half years, um, I will tell you if there is one thing I see people screw up over and over and over again, it's balance. Half the time, and this is going to sound bad, but half the time, like when somebody sends me a mix, they're like, what's wrong with this? I'm like, dude, if you would have just taken the tracks that we gave you and balanced them correctly, you would have done a better job. You completely over-mixed everything. And they don't realize it. And that's like a real aha moment for a lot of people because, look, when people are like, dude, 1176 on bass, we're like, yeah, that's awesome. They're like, yeah, I won't do that again. <laughs> They're like, yeah, that's awesome. They get super excited about that. They're like, gear. 
converters. They're like, oh, wow. I heard on the internet you can put parallel compression, and that's what big people do on their drum mix. So you got to use parallel compression. It's sick. People get stoked about that. If you're like balanced, they're like, man, get out of here with that. Moving faders, that's not cool. It's not sexy. It's not fun. When you were a little child, you don't get up and walk for the first time and immediately go and win the 40-yard dash in the Olympics. You, wait, you get up and you start crawling. Then you start walking. You run into the wall a few times. You're like, oh, don't run into the wall. It hurts. It sucks. You fall. Don't fall. Then you run and then you're like, you know, don't do that. You know, then you go out, you train, you eat your Wheaties, you have a good coach. And then one day, hopefully, if you're fast enough, you get into the Olympics. It's the same thing with mixing. Everybody wants to sit down and be like, oh, man, parallel saturation. Woo! Balance, my friends. Fundamentals are everything. I've watched two and a half years every month a different mixer of the top people in the world at rock and metal kicking out all the biggest bands mix. And none of them are doing anything crazy. You know what they're masters of? Balance, EQ, dynamics. And the stuff on top over there. Getting the groove, the vocals, the sustained instruments. You know? That's what separates them from anybody who's not mixing on the top A-list. They're masters of the fundamentals. They know how loud to turn that guitar and when to make it up and things like that. You know, sometimes they do some tricky stuff, but I've watched so many amazing people mix. And I will tell you that fundamentals are everything and it's so easy to overlook. So after that, we have EQ. We got anybody in here who knows how to cook? No one? Okay, we got a few. All right. You guys like to eat at least? All right, we got a few people that like to eat. I like to eat too. I like to cook as well. So if you've ever eaten a soup that doesn't have any salt in it, you'll be like, oh, what up, kidney bean? Piece of cilantro. Well, I think that was cumin. It's weird. It's like a mixture of like chunks. When you put the right amount of salt in it, all of a sudden it stops being a bunch of individual elements and it becomes something. It becomes a soup. And then you're like, oh, that's a damn good chili. Oh, that's great. I love that. That tastes delicious. What is that? That's an amazing chicken cordon bleu. So, EQ is what takes all of our instruments like this, whittles them into a tight, knit, functioning packet. It's like taking a bunch of raw paint colors and making a masterpiece out of it. So you gotta get your EQ right, after your balance, of course. Then dynamics, or the lack thereof, in 2018. <laughs> some genres require dynamics, some do not. Like, if you use dynamics and metal, people will be like, what are you doing? Like, that's not metal, bro, that's not even heavy. Like, it doesn't slam. This mix sucks. Now, if you were to do that in jazz and you just like turned in like just everything hyper limited, people would be like, what is this? Oh, you know, I was going for something aggressive. And you're like, so that's that. After that, it's like distortion and effect. So let's put this in perspective for a second. It does not matter how awesome the delay that you made on the vocals that goes into this parallel saturated gated reverb at three minutes and 18 seconds sounds. It does not, uh, you know, on the record. If your drum shells are disconnected from your cymbals to the point where you're so they sound like they're floating in space. So if you have not gotten your balance, no one cares how cool the effect you just made is or how cool the stutter <laughs> sound that you just made and the glitch vocal and all that stuff. It doesn't matter because if you've not gotten your fundamentals right, that's it. So what you focus on in mixing matters and it matters dearly because I would rather not sit down and make a bunch of crazy effects and do what I think it needs and have the band come back and be like, can you add this, this, and this, and say yes. Then make a bunch of crazy effects and have the band be like, dude, you murdered her song. And that happens. It happened to anybody in here? You've like went overboard to show the band how great you are as a producer, how smart you are. And they're like, dude, what did you do to our song? We just wanted it raw. And you're like, oh yeah, dude, I was just trying some stuff. <laughs> Crap. It happens. So let's fo focus on the things that matter. The balance, the EQ, the dynamics. The drums, the beat, the bass, the low end, the vocals, and the stringed instruments. All this other stuff is gravy. So focus on getting that stuff right, and your mixes will go from here to here immediately. Promise you. All right, now let's talk about some really, really good stuff. Clients and dealing with them. Or not. Misconception. Most aspiring mixers think that in order to be an employed mixing engineer, you've got to be available to talk to your clients 24-7, 365, via text, chat, instant messenger, email, your mom's answering machine, your sister's cell phone. Seriously, how many people have ever gotten a mixed note over text? Right after you got an email with revisions. And you're like, wait, oh yeah, dude, I forgot to put this in. I can feel the hate building in this room. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to fix that problem. Because um, that sucks. 
Actually, I turn my phone now off, remember my story earlier, at 5 p.m. every day, on weekends, all day, and I still manage to mix over 500 songs a year while handling all of my clients' revisions in an orderly fashion. And like I said, it is awesome to be able to take my kids to the zoo on a Saturday and not be like, oh, honey, I got to go in and run this thing. The deadline's this. I don't play that game anymore because I wised up and I got smarter. And uh, I'm going to show you how to do that. But how do you do it? Real simple. Just like I have systems of templates and all this other stuff, I have systems for client interaction that cover pricing interactions, mixed revisions, mixed delivery, time frames, and session delivery requirements. Systems are our friends. Now look, we're, we're audio people. What are audio people not good at? We're good at being creative, right? What we're not good at is organization. We're not good at being business people. It doesn't come naturally to us because we're creative. That's that left brain stuff that we hate to do like, oh, I gotta pay taxes. Oh wait, I've gotta, I got, you need all of my receipts like for the whole year? I gotta find all those? I mean, dude, I just threw that out. Your accountant's like, really? I'm like, dude, I, I had a mix to do. Like, I don't care, you know? I mean, like, you see how that's, you know what I mean? Like, we're not organized. So I'm gonna teach you how to get organized. What we're, the goal with clients is to take people who are unorganized, people in bands, especially people in bands, and put them into a system that forces them to behave in a certain way so that it's better for them and way better and less stressful for you. So it's a much smoother process. So we set rules that have to be followed. For example, you can set a 48-hour mixed note revision requirement or else the mix is final guideline. So the client is forced to make decisions instead of wasting your time. Now, I, this is one of my favorite because some people don't understand the difference between mixing and producing. They send you the mix, like one time I was mixing a very big, very, very famous metal band, and we got done mixing, and they're like, so when are you gonna put in a bunch of post-production and stuff like that? I'm like, what, what? I'm like, I'm like, I just turned in the final record. Like, yeah, all the mixes sound great, everything's approved, but uh, can, you, can you write a cool a bunch of effects and sub-drops and snare bombs and reverse this and that and glitches? And I'm like, what? I'm like, dude, I'm the mixer, man. They're like, I'm like, are you giving me points on this record? Like, like hold on, because I agreed to do this for X, and that, you know what I mean? So what happens then in that scenario, you, you, or this is my favorite, the A&R. The A&R will be like, oh, I need this mix right away. We're on a tight deadline. They're freaking out. You're like, okay, chill, chill. You turn in the mix, and then they make you wait for three weeks. Oh, yeah, I haven't gotten around to it yet. Hurry up and wait. So you tell them this, and you make them agree to it in your contract. Because when that's there, you could be like, oh, you guys didn't get back to me. Not my problem. You can't be responsible. So, that, you know, obviously you want to do it within, sec you know, within reason, but... This is a good rule to have. Another one, requiring all mixed notes to be delivered through only one person in the band. This is like the best thing in the world. Here's how this works. You're sitting down, the guitar player sends you notes, you're like, cool. You start running them, the singer's like, oh yeah, do this, and then you get a contradictory note, and you're like, what? This guy says turn this up, this guy says turn this down, what do I do? Anybody ever had that problem? Oh yeah, you know, you know what's up. That sucks. Because then you're like, well, what do I do? And then you call the band and they get in an argument. Now you're driving a band fight, you're like, I could have had this song mixed. And now I've been on the phone for 45 minutes arguing with three people because they can't make their decision. How do we eliminate that problem? Because it happens all the time and it sucks. You know, you get different things. One guy's texting you, the other person's, you know, emailing you. You say, you send me one email. One email from one person. Everything else goes, delete, straight to the bin. Have a nice day. Game over. I'm not even going to read it. Don't email me. Don't text me. These are the rules. One person. So the band gets together and they say, here's what we want to do and they make decisions. See how that works? <laughs> you they make actual decisions to say, these are the notes that we want. Then you orderly knock them out and be like, here you go. Oh, wow. That saved me lots of gray hairs on my head. <laughs> um, okay. Another thing that can be good is the number of set revisions a client can ask for before you implement upcharges. Now, I personally will make as many revisions as possible, but I always put that in the thing because I want them to understand something. We are not here to experiment. Again, I was mixing a very famous metal band about a decade ago. And I got to mix four, they're like, everything's great. I need the bass drop, you know, the part that goes, mmm, you know, like that thing. Can you turn that up at DB? I'm like, yeah, no problem. Tw Next day, uh, can you turn it down too? I'm like, from the first mix or what I just, yeah, yeah, fr from the first mix. Okay, so now I'm at minus two. Then the next day, um, can you bring it back up 0.5? And then the next day, can you go up to, can you go back to the original level? And, I, and then I emailed them, I'm like, look, pick a level, this is the final revision. And then, the, then they picked one. So the band didn't know what they were doing, they were experimenting, they were playing games, we weren't mixing. They thought like, you know, they're not respecting my time as a professional. And if my job is to not sit there and play games with a bass drop, and you know, they, they should figure that stuff out. So we need to make the bands make decisions. We have to do it or else we are the ones that pay for it, not them. They get what they want, but you have to set rules. 
So just like it took me years to build templates, it took me years, and I mean years, to perfect an email template through trial and error. So I'm going to show it to you right now. And if you get anything out of this lecture, if you take this email template and tweak it to your own things and use something like this, this will save you so much stress and time. This alone has changed my life right here. Every time I don't do this, I get burned and screwed. And I, and I realized, look, why did I agree to that? So what you do is this. You send them an email with a bunch of terms, and then they reply that they agree. They accept it. So it's enforceable. So you can be like, look, we have a deal. You agreed to this, and now you're violation. And they go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So, you know, obviously you can be flexible. Like, we always want to be flexible and give our clients the best benefit of the doubt so you can give them a great experience. But we need to set rules so they know that you're serious because they need to respect our time. You deserve to have your time respected as a professional. You are not their slave. You are there to help them take their art, but they have to be respectful of the agreement. And people will walk all over you if you don't make them do that. So, let's break this down. Hello, I'm very excited to start working with you on your project. Here are the guidelines to help you establish our working relationship and ensure that everything goes smoothly. You can put the person's name in there, that's important. All right, we're going to start with payment, the important stuff. You guys like getting paid? I like getting paid. It helps. You know, kids, kids can't eat air. It doesn't, doesn't feed them very well, but money does. Okay, so look, to get started, I need 50% down before I'm going to start mixing anything and the rest due on completion. I will not send you the final wave version masters until I've received all of my payment. Super important. Once I've received, you'll promptly have your masters, and this is non-negotiable. My friends, every time, mark my words, that I've ever violated this rule, guess what? I've gotten burned on it. I have literally sat down in one particular scenario, actually twice this is happening with a label guy who, you know, wanted to take nine months to pay me. And I said, I know the record's due today at 5, and it's like 2 in the afternoon, but um, I'd love to send you your master's, but I don't have my money, and you owe me a lot. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll get to that. I'm like, I'm not pushing send. Here, here's a, here's a cell phone, a little selfie of me, hi, with my finger on the send button in the we transfer with all the masters to your email directly. All I need to do is hit send, but right next to that, see, that's my Wells Fargo account. I don't see any money in it. You'll be shocked how fast that money shows up in your account. All of a sudden, oh, I spent it at the borough. I don't have it. Boom, 20 minutes later, it's in your account. You're like, what's up? Sent. Thank you. If you don't do that, nine months later, guys, where's my money? Oh, well, you know, checks in the mail. Oh. You never relinquish masters to a band until they have paid you. You did work. You deserve to get paid. You don't want to have to take a band to court. If you go to court, that ruins the relationship. It sucks. Don't do it. I've never done it, and I never want to do it. But I've seen people do it and go through it because somebody violated the agreement. They'd spent two months of their lives working on a record, and then they just decided to stiff them for whatever reason. You did the work. People got to eat, you know? You deserve to be paid. So there's the rule. No masters. Don't ever violate it. Next, as discussed in my pricing code, why? Cost an additional X per song. So if they want backing tracks and you feel like you want to be paid for your time to do backing tracks, there's the price. You can list any price that you have for any additional service. Me, these vocals need to be tuned. I'll tune them, or you can have your engineer do it, but it's going to cost you 20 bucks a song. Whatever. You set the rules for yourself. But that's the place to put it. All right, next, project turnaround time. Super important stuff. Please communicate to me your desired turnaround time for the project in advance so I can schedule you accordingly. Super important, you know, especially if you mix 10 bands at once like I do. You need to be able to make sure they fit. Um, I will give you a realistic turnaround time once I've reviewed the files to make sure that everything is in compliance with a mix guide. That's super important in case you get stuff and it's labeled audio underscore dupe 148. Like, what the hell is this? Where does this go? It's not even exported from zero. Hello? So you create a guide, which I don't have time to show you today, but, you know, you, you learn these rules as you go, what, what good file prep is. And after I've reviewed the files, if there's any additional services outside of that, I can recommend them and we can discuss. Okay, mix notes. As requested in my pricing quote, I will do up to three revisions for song. You can pick however many you want. I mean, you know, after that, they or they're billed at an extra X per revision. Important, please designate one contact. And we talk about this for all of the notes. I will only accept notes for that person. Um, mixed notes will be communicated in email in written form. We can discuss them on the phone, but it doesn't exist unless it's in my email. When I send a revision, you have 48 hours to reply back to you with the mixed notes or it's considered final. We talked about that. If I'm mixing more than one song, this is important, I request to receive all my notes for all the songs at the same time. Because this helps me avoid confusion and stay organized, resulting in less revisions. And after we finish the first single, please let me do all my first mixes for the rest of the song uh, before I do mix notes. So I can batch everything. So I can sit down and be like, mix the first one, 
to prove. Now I'm going to mix the other nine songs. Boom, I'm going to do notes for all the nine. So I'm doing them in efficient blocks instead of jumping around projects because every time your brain switches to a different song, you completely forgot everything you did on the song you mixed before that. So you don't want to open sessions. You only want to open the minimum of sessions and load times and waiting. This is how you do it. Uh, I will provide a change log when submitting revisions so that you can see how, that I executed your mixing notes or I have issue with it, very important, because that way when the drummer's like, dude, I told you to turn up the snare, I'd be like, dude, see the X? I already did it. But if you'd like it louder, I'd be happy to turn it up for you. All right, then delivery. This stuff is pretty standard. You'll get them in WAV format if you need a DDP, a CD, whatever. Um, alternate mixed revisions. And then you can just say, hey, look forward to working with you. Boom, your name. All right. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try to rip this real fast. I'll teach you how to hack your EQ speed, and we're going to do Q&A. If there's one thing that can physically speed up your mixing, it's learn to EQ faster. How can we speed that up? We create a repeatable, trainable method, and then we train to get gains so we can be jacked, tan, and mixing AF. So I wrote a great blog on Sonic Scoop. I hope you read it, because I don't have time to go through this. But I'm going to introduce you the LDFC method, which is listen, diagnose, fix, and compare. Meaning you listen to a sound, you say, what's wrong with it? Does it need to be brighter? Is it too sibilant? Is it too dark? Does it, is it muddy in the mid-range? Does it need to be crisper? Does it need, you know, is it a little bit too tubby? You know, you figure it out, then you diagnose it, you fix it, and then you compare. Now, as you get better at mixing, what will happen is you will be able faster at comparing, and you'll be able to do it automatically. Um, actually, like I said, I did write a very good blog on this on Sonic Scoop. Go read it, because I'm going to teach you how to train it. And I'm going to show you a little three-minute video demonstrating. OK, rules. So you're going to grab a few sessions. For after you finish mixing, you're going to remove all the EQ on them. The more songs you mix, the better. You need to understand that because there are a lot. Um, the more songs you mix, the more problems you solve. If you just do this on one song and train all over, you're not getting better at mixing. You're getting better at mixing if you're mixing a lot of different songs. So you're going to grab a session, take off all the EQ. You're going to rebalance the faders as needed so everything is there. And we just want to go through each instrument and EQ them. You're going to go through the session, EQ each track individually in solo. And then you're gonna, you can EQ in whatever order you choose. I usually start with drums. You only get 15 seconds to EQ each instrument. Yeah, I said 15. That sounds like a lot. Try it. You'll be like, damn, it's 15 seconds and I only got one move. Whoa. But if we're trying to train our gut to go faster, OK? You want to make split decisions and trust your instinct and not overthink stuff. We're trying to get that out of your brain. Use a stopwatch. No cheating. I'll find you. <laughs> Don't cheat. And Compare your finished mix to your raw one, and then repeat. OK, so you're going to train one hour a day for seven days, a month if you're hardcore. And pro tip, I recommend using a graphic stock parametric EQ, because one's with knobs. Unless you're mixing on a console, it's different. But clicking a mouse and dragging knobs is very difficult, and it sucks from a UI perspective. So grab a point and shift. So you can be like, boom, boom, boom. All right. Baby steps, making this easier for beginners, because I realize that this is ridiculous, because I have trained hundreds of people with this, and I've literally watched their lives go like that. Some of people can't handle it. They need 30 seconds to mix. So what you can do is you try using a single shelf and asking yourself, does the mix need to be brighter or darker, thicker or thinner? That's super important. And if you do what I say, and you actually train this, you're going to get much faster at EQ. So let's see it in action. I've got uh, like a four minute video I'm going to show you. And then we'll do Q&A and we'll wrap up. And then I'm going to be in the Steinberg booth and I'll be happy to answer any questions and hang out and talk to you guys about mixing faster or whatever you want to talk about. Training number one, LDFC. This is one of my personal favorites. You get 15 seconds to EQ each sound. I'm going to do it much faster than that. I've got a song here set up just as an example. I've got a bunch of pre-routing and bussing and everything and pre-balancing. So I can go through this and very quickly show you guys what bar to set at in terms of speed. Hopefully you guys can get even faster than me at this stuff. But again, because it's a repeatable method, you have to train, 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 train. The more you train this, the faster you get at it. So let's do it. We're going to listen, diagnose, fix, and compare. You're going to find that I don't even necessarily compare. I have a, a shot of it in my head of what it sounds like before and after. And once I get it to after, I don't even need to necessarily compare it that much in the mix. So let's do it. All right, we're going to start the pretend timer. And I'm going to smoke this song in less than 15 minutes. And I'm not going to spend more than 15 seconds EQing a single sound. Let's mix. <laughs>
going to say that after EQ, it's okay to rebalance just a little bit. All right, let's compare it. See, wasn't that fun? All right, so I'm gonna head over to the mixer. I'm going to just collapse all these inserts. I'm going to link up all these channels. Now, I didn't put vocals in this and some of the extra overdubs and stuff like that, but it doesn't matter. This is just for comparison. I don't wanna sit here for another 15 minutes and mix this for you guys. You get the point. So I'm gonna link these channels and we're gonna compare it before and after. Already starting to sound like a mix, so there you go. That is the LDFC challenge in action. Training number one, your turn. That's how you do it. All right, so before we wrap this up, um, what we covered, we developed templates, we changed what we focus on, we systematize client interaction, and we hack our EQ speed. All this is part of a system I put together nailthemix.com slash speed mixing if you want to learn more about this. We already ran the 2018, so this probably won't come out until next year. Uh, Justin, do we have any time for questions, or should they just come meet me at the booth? I think we should have people meet you at the Cubase Steinberg booth. I know I'm back. late. So. We usually don't let people go over, but Joel is just too good. Big round of applause for Joel, please. Nice. Really well done. Thank you. And keep it going. Big round of applause for making this possible and free the public. Cubase and Steinberg, big round of applause for those guys making this all happen.